Let's take a little time to reveal The prehistoric stories that the earth once concealed Mix them all together on this ancient land It's time to spread some paleo jam Welcome to another episode of Paleo Jam. I'm your host, Michael Mills, and we're live in Armidale for National Science Week at the Welder's Dog Brewery. This is the second episode recording tonight in this place. We've just had a short break, and the panel and the audience both seem to have availed themselves of the local produce, and it's quite delicious, I must say. <gasps> Hello, people of Armidale. <laughs> we are, of course, here on Anawain Country, and um, just a reminder, of course, that... Here in Australia, we have so many stories that live in this place, that have lived here for thousands of years, um, and that we become part of those stories the more that we tell our own stories and share those stories. I come from Adelaide on Ghana country, travelled across a whole lot of different countries to be here, in what I like to refer to, this country that we call Australia, but it's a continent of countries and has been for thousands of years, and always important to remember where we live and the stories from here. So to discuss some of the fascinating paleontological research going on at the University of New England, just down the road, including the boundary between the Ediacans and the Cambrians, reviewing our understanding of an astonishing predator from the early Cambrian, and one of the things paleontologists gets asked more than just about anything, how did the dinosaurs get so big, having dragged themselves away from the brewing part of the building... I'm joined by Professor John Patterson. Hello, Michael. Hello, John. Uh, Dr. Marissa Betts. And Dr. Nick Campion. Yoni. <laughs> um, so, the University of New England has a... Is it a paleontology department? Is that what you call it? Because there's a whole lot of paleontological research that goes on there, isn't there? It's the Paleoscience Research Centre. That's a bit fancy. The Paleoscience Research Centre. Um, and one of the things I often... Conversations I've had across a few places in the last month are that if you wanted to be a paleontologist in Australia 20 to 30 years ago, or maybe even less... If you wanted to study paleontology, you actually had to go overseas. But what we're now seeing is, is it's, it's very much the other way, isn't it? You've been here the longest, John. Do you want to do this one? <laughs> John. I would say that's probably true depending on what aspect of paleontology you want to study. So let's use the iconic group, the dinosaurs, and until, you know, maybe even only 20 years ago, um, we didn't know much at all about Australian dinosaurs. And so if you were a keen bean and wanted to go and study dinosaurs, you would go to North America or somewhere in Europe where they have more of them. But we're now finding a lot more in Australia, um, and that includes a lot of the work that's being done at UNE, by people like Nick and also Phil Bell. And um, the diversity is increasing rapidly. So, yeah, uh, Australia is now becoming a bit of a hub for certain part, certain aspects of paleontology in certain time periods or looking at certain fossil groups. And case in point is that we're now getting students who want to come here to study paleontology. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> glorious response from the audience there. Um, so, Marissa, you, you were going to say something? Well, I was also going to say that since COVID, there's been quite a few very sad closures of paleontology departments, particularly in the east coast of Australia. Um, but that hasn't happened at UNE. In fact, we've gone the other way. We've built up and become stronger and got more students and more staff. And so um, that means that um, we are one of the, the biggest, if not the biggest, and most diverse paleontology research and teaching group in Australia. So if you want to be a paleontologist and you just happen to live in Armidale, 
because I know a, a bunch. I have a bunch of friends that want want, want to be paleontologists and they're studying paleontology, and they've even in Australia they've they've had to move states. But if you live in Armidale, you you don't have to go anywhere, do you? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nope. You can you can stay here. Okay. Let's let's um, start for want of a better description, digging into the research, the cool research that, that each of you do. And in particular, we talked this morning about what's, what's a particular thing that you, we, we, you can each talk about. Um, Marissa, um, you've been in Mongolia. So, so you can study paleontology at the University of New, Ang- New England um, and you can study local stuff and Australian stuff. And that's part of what you do. But as part of that, you can also travel the world. Mongolia, what's the deal with Mongolia? Mongolia is an amazing place and it has some of the most remarkable geology. It's very complex geology, sort of crammed in the middle of of Asia there. Um, The dinosaur group as well go to Mongolia. So Nick's been to Mongolia as well and um, our other colleague, Dr Phil Bell, He's off on Wednesday to go to the dinosaur festival they're running at the moment in the south, in the Gobi. Um, But like I said earlier, I work on the Cambrian, and that's much, much older than the dinosaur, so 500 um, and also million years ago. And the Cambrian record in Mongolia is among the best in the world. Um, I do a lot of biostratigraphy, so that's understanding the evolutionary passage of uh, fossils through time, using them to date rocks and correlate rocks around the world. I started doing a lot of work in South Australia on the Cambrian fossil record there. Um, And since then, I've started to include packages of rocks in China, South China, North China, Canada, Antarctica, and also Mongolia. So... They're about the same age, and I'm looking at the fossils in these rocks and using fossils to date them and correlate those different packages of rocks um, between each other around the world. So what, what's it telling us? So the record, the Cambrian record in Mongolia um, is uh, mostly comprised of limestones. Limestones are wonderful for finding shelly fossils, and that's what I'm really looking for. Um, The Cambrian rocks in Mongolia, turns out they're a bit older than the rocks in South Australia, and they actually sit right on top of the Ediacaran. So the the boundary... Which which you'd expect them to, wouldn't you? So... so Yeah, you would expect them to. Because you dig down deeper and you go back, you're you're, you're time travelling, you're going back Yeah, that's right. So they sit on top of it. So, yeah, the Cambrian in the time scale sits just on top of the period of time called the Ediacaran. The boundary between those two um, chunks of time um, is a very, very important um, boundary in the geological time scale. It's the transition from the pre-Cambrian, when the world was dominated by microbes um, and single-celled life, maybe some um, uh, macroscopic things, things that you could see with the naked eye at the very later stages of the Ediacaran. But it wasn't until we got into the Lower Cambrian when life just went crazy. They call it the Cambrian explosion of life. And it's when we have um, all of the different uh, animal body plans that we know in the modern day appearing in the fossil record in the geological blink of an eye. Okay, so so when you talk about a geological blink of an eye, we're not talking about... Because when I think of an explosion... Mm -hmm. um, I think of of, of a volcanic explosion. I think of, of, of... an explosion is a thing that is an instant thing, isn't it? But geologically, when you're talking about a, an explosion in geological time, how, how long are we talking? Oh, that's a really good question. Maybe it's also a question for John. Who's, yeah, John. <laughs> John, <laughs> who's done quite a bit of you. work on. Yeah, on well, that. I would say, again, considering the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, we're talking in terms of the length of the Cambrian explosion event, it's less than 20 million years. But what you cram into that amount of time is quite unbelievable, as Marissa's alluding to. So, for example, you see pretty much all of the major animal groups that we're aware of today so appearing... When you, when, when you say all of the major animal groups, what, what, what do you mean? Okay, so 
Um, well, I mean, we're familiar with ourselves as vertebrates. We backboned so animals. Animals with backbones, animals with shells. Yep, so things like mollusks, um, arthropods, which are... Which are spiders. Spiders, crabs, Cockroach. centipedes, so insects. So all of those different... So if you think of the animals that are alive today, all of the different kinds of animals seem to have appeared in that explosion. Yes. 20 million year explosion. Um, I do have a question. Um, is, is it an actual explosion or is it... <laughs> um, is it a, a... Does it tell us more about the fossil record? Like what's been preserved and what hasn't? Because there's been some conversations from time to time in the lead up to the extinction of most of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, there was some research that said, oh, actually, actually, the dinosaurs were already declining. There's some alternate research that tells us that actually they weren't declining, it's just that the fossil record isn't as good in that period. So we don't think it was necessarily declining, it's just that the fossil record doesn't... Because the fossil record is always going to be incomplete, isn't it? So yeah. how, do we, how do we know that it's one or the other? Well, I, I would quickly say, and then Marissa can, can jump in as well, but so we talked about the Akron period just before the Cambrian. So in the late, later part of that geologic period, we see a bunch of macroscopic things, so large, large things, some things the size of a bath mat, that are probably multicellular, fairly complex, but when we look at what we call the Ediacra biota living at this time, there's very few things you can put in a modern category of organisms. So we see some things that look a bit like an arthropod or look a bit like a mollusk, but they don't have all the right features to go, that's definitely a mollusk, that's definitely an arthropod, etc., etc. So when, as soon as you go into Cambrian Age rocks, we start to find the remains of organisms where you can say, that's definitely a mollusk, that's definitely an arthropod. So, so was the Ediacara period um, a, 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 a kind of a, a, an experimental... And I, and I suppose nature does, is constantly experimenting anyway because everything has the potential to change depending on you know, the changes to geology and environments and, and stuff. So do, do we... I guess is, do we start to see more clarity in the definition of, of the kinds of organisms in that time? It's, it's, I would say by the time you get to the Cambrian, things have become modern-like. So they're recognisable to us in the modern day. So things that we would... OK, and, and I guess it's always going to be a reference to, to, to us and what we see and what we know. So we're always going to look at the world through our human eyes. So it's that thing of seeing the things that we acknowledge and recognise. Um, I want to come to... to, to S stick with you for a minute, John, um, because sitting, for those of you at home, you can't see it, but there's a, in front of the stage, there's a, a thing that John has in his garden, and it's a life-size, um, it's made of, it's this really cool steampunk looking, and I think it belongs here in the, in the, in the brewery, I'm just saying they should get one themselves and have it here, um, an Anomalocaris. So Anomalocaris is one of the first predators, mm -hmm. kind of. But your recent research, uh, you and the team, has slightly changed that. Because at the South Australian Museum, there's a label that has some trilobite coprolites. Or, or, well, coprolites made of trilobites. So that's poo. So that's smashed up trilobites. Um, and the, the prevailing view has always been, oh, OK, that's... Anomalocaris that's eaten that. You're suggesting maybe that's not the case. Yeah. So ever since we've discovered what Anomalocaris is or what it looks like, which is what you see in front of you, these two grasping, grasping appendages at the front of the head, there's a little bulbous structure of the eyes. Underneath the head, there's a cog. <laughs> But it's actually the mouth part, the circular it's mouth part. It's a weird part. cog. It's this really, really strange, weird... Google an image now of Anomalocaris if you're listening and have a look. It's got this really weird circular cog thing underneath, doesn't it? Yeah. So they use those frontal appendages at the front of the head to grab prey and then they 
use them to shove food into that circular mouth. So it's like me when, when I'm like at a buffet <laughs> and I'm using my hands to grab the food and hurl the food into my mouth. Is, it, is like that, that the kind of... Yeah. yeah Except... That. I would love to see you at a buffet. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> where's the buffet in Armadale? Tell me afterwards. Yeah. So I'd say, because we haven't known the full um, body of Anomalocaris since about the 1980s, even though we've known bits and pieces of the animal since the late 1800s. But when it wasn't until complete specimens were found that we put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Because it was thought to be several different animals. Yes. And, and that, can, that can happen. You find, you find these fossils, these bits of things, in different places, and they're weird, and you, you, you're, they're, they're unfamiliar, and you're not going to automatically assume, well, obviously, that round, weird thing is the mouth of that thing with those big appendages thing that has this other body bit and stuff. Yeah. So the reason it's got the name Anomalocaris, which means anomalous shrimp, is because those frontal appendages were thought to be the bodies of a shrimp, but they could never find the head because <laughs> they're always looking for a prawn-like head. Okay? But until they found articulated specimens, whole specimens, they realised that that's only a part of the head. The head's much bigger, it has stalked eyes, really good vision, and this circular mouth under, underneath. I've seen old reconstructions that, that reconstruct the mouth as its own kind of jellyfish-like yes. organism sort of floating in the background. So Anomalocaris, the, the history of describing the animal, it's had about four different names and been attributed to different organisms. So, yeah, the mouth part was thought to be a jellyfish. Part of the body was thought to be a sea cucumber, all kinds of stuff. Um, but ever since we've known the full body of the animal, it's, it's been touted as this apex predator, the sort of the, the king of the pile, if you like, or the, or the food chain, the top of the food chain. And um, straight away, people started to think, Ah, this is the thing that's chomping trilobites. So trilobites are, are these um, extinct uh, arthropods, a bit, bit like crustaceans of different kinds, like a Balmain bug or, or, or a slater in your garden, like a pill bug. Um, because often when we look in these Cambrian Age deposits, we see bite marks taken out of them. And sometimes they're healed, sometimes they're not. And just given the sheer size of this thing, you know, we're, we're talking up to a metre in length, it's thought that ah, that's the only thing that must have been chomping trilobites. But to come back to your original question, in the Emu Bay Shale on Kangaroo Island in South Australia, we find fairly large bits of fossilised poo which contain chomped up parts of trilobites. And you also get anomalocaris, in that same deposit, and we thought, okay. So it's reasonable to assume that yep, that's Anomalocaris fair. is eating. Except that um, recently we started to find the legs of trilobites, including a very big one called Red Lichia Rex, which um, Jimmy Holmes, who's also in the audience, described. <laughs> and we discovered that the legs of this thing were built for chewing very hard things. And given that uh, Relichia rex probably grew to the size of a dinner plate, it was the only other thing big enough to actually chomp trilobites. So, so trilobites were eating trilobites? Exactly. With their legs? Yes. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait, no, what? How do you... Like, I mean... I'm, I was talking before about like me going to the buffet and grabbing food and <laughs> slamming it into my mouth with my hands. I wouldn't have done that with my legs. Uh, trilobites chew with their legs. The what? They chew with their legs? Yes. So it's not even that they're grabbing the food with their legs and sticking it into their mouths. They're chewing it with their legs. I'm like, I, nature just does my head in sometimes. <laughs> Nature's just... Like, I, 
I write, I write stories and things, and there is nothing I will ever write that will be more bizarre than nature. <laughs> like, don't get me started on octopuses and the fact that most of their neurons are not in their brains, they're in their bodies. Like, just what? <laughs> nature, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to be all right. <laughs> so the, the clincher to this story is that we, we just published another study that modelled the, what we call the biomechanics of the frontal appendages of Anomalocara. So in other words, we use fancy computer modelling to show whether they could grab things with any force, particularly something armoured like a trilobite. And, we, and the modelling was telling us that it, if a normal car has tried to grab a trilobite, it would basically break all its spines off. <laughs> so that it's it's fascinating, isn't it? When when you you have these these, these these modern techniques that allow us to go, oh, the, the the theropod dinosaurs, for example, like we used to think that they would walk around standing upright. It's like mm, actually, if they did that, their their legs would kind of come out of their hips and their tails would snap. But that was because we had modern computers to be able to play with those, those, those models of those things. Dinosaurs, Nick. Yes. This is your, this is your life, Nick Campione. So long neck dinosaurs were very big. They were, yes. Very, very big. Some are, uh, what, 40 meters long? Oh, length is a terrible way to look at size. Body mass is by far Body the mass. best way. Body yep. mass. Okay, so, and, and I'm often asked the question, oh, so what's the biggest ever dinosaur? Ooh, good question. And, and it's, a, it's an interesting question, is it? Because we only find the individuals. Correct. We don't find yep. the biggest version. Correct. Of we, the we, we find an example of an animal. We don't have the full population. We don't have the full range and full capacity. And in fact, sometimes we'll find, we'll, ha we'll have multiple specimens of a particular species, and then we'll have this one anomaly that we, we, will, we may only have maybe a scapula or a particular bone that we can't even assign to the right species because we don't have the right bones, but we can tell that it's 50% larger, for instance. So, because with long necks, we, we do not have a complete long neck fossil, do we? Oh, we know we have some pretty complete fossils. Yeah. It's well, not, I just, just not, maybe then. not in Australia, yeah. <laughs> but. Uh... All right, so, yes. so um, some of the research you've been doing mm -hmm. is how they got so big. Well, or why they got so big. What, what? Because yeah. cause we, we know, I suppose people, again, people. A common question for people is like, wh why do animals keep getting big? So right. you, you have the megafauna. You yep. have throughout, mm -hmm. you know, you get a period of stability and, yep. and animals tend to get... To get larger. ...seem to That's get right. larger. So, yes. so why is that? And why dinosaurs... Very good question. ...so big? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the question of why in the fossil record is a very difficult question to actually tackle. We, as paleontologists, have to reconstruct the past. We're looking at patterns... And patterns are relatively easy to come up with. We can detect them, we can measure them, we can uh, put them uh, on, a, on a plot. And we can kind of tell you how things happened, why becomes a very difficult question. And typically what we want to do is look at modern things, look at living things. And, you know, for instance, we had John talking and Rissa talking about you know, the origin of modern animals going all the way back to the, the Cambrian. That's because they can make comparisons with animals that live today. And when we work on dinosaurs, it's really no, no, no different. And what you notice with living animals is that there is a sort of general tendency for things to get larger over time. It's a phenomenon known as Cope's rule. It's not a, it's not a really good rule. It's a rule that's meant to be broken, really, on a regular basis. But what happens is you can think of it from the point of view that if you are a little bit larger, maybe you're a little bit stronger, you can compete with your neighbor to get more food, to find more mates. And so overall, over time, that can manifest itself as like a general tendency for things to get larger. So uh, 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 thinking about somewhere like hmm. Africa in the moment with hmm. zebras and lions, are, are they getting bigger? Probably on this kind of like microevolutionary scale, 
if you were to track it over time, yeah, I would I would expect to see a general tendency to and get larger. And it's because the bigger zebras and the faster zebras but survive. It gives and you that like, like offspring, a little bit of, a, of, a, of slightly, an additional advantage. Yep. Yep. The thing is that over time, large things are hard to maintain. If you're larger, you need more food. Um, you need more resources. So you need to expand a lot more. Um, it's you know you get heavier, so your bones need to get bigger, and so your your necessity for resources ex increases exponentially. And so it's actually hard to get big over time. And in fact, if you if, if you then put a particular extinction pressure on a large animal, it is less likely to be able to recover over time because it can't reproduce as fast. Mammals, for instance, ha take, they, they, the reproduction time increases as you get larger and larger and larger. Uh, elephants are pregnant forever. And so it <laughs> That's takes, quite a long time, isn't it's, it? It's a really long time. And you can imagine that actually it hinders your ability to survive because it is a big imposition. Um, dinosaurs so, yeah, so did, my, my, mice. Mice, mice for yes, example, yeah, they, they yeah. have a very short that's right, short duration, period. but they reproduce like crazy. They reproduce like mice, or they reproduce like rabbits. And they create lots of babies. And so that is a, a sort of a, a general phenomenon. Small things reproduce a lot. They have big populations. They can survive mass extinctions a lot better. And one of the sort of things that have come out of the end Cretaceous mass extinction is that small things did OK. Big things did not did do very well. <laughs> and you won't, because as is a, is a giant herbivore that's yep. 50 tons, That's right. you need to eat a lot of food. A lot of food, yeah. And you've got this massive asteroid that's smashed into the Earth yep. that has caused like the sky to be mm -hmm. on fire yep. as, as the, 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 the meteor smashed into the Earth, bounced back up, all of the bits have fallen back down again, you've got bushfires everywhere. So like, if you're a T-Rex or Australovenator, the first couple of weeks is glorious mm. if you manage to survive. So many bodies. It's like barbecue city. Yeah. Um, Tastes amazing. Taste heaven. Is that mm. what you just said? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, so so it's, it's glorious for that short period of time. But then you have to find food. food. Yep. And again, using the mice thing, if you're a T-Rex, or you're an Australovenator, you yeah. can't find enough mice to eat, right. can you? Yeah. And if you're a, 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 a giant long neck, you need a lot of plants, right. and they've been, yeah. been wiped out. Yeah, yeah so the, the question of why dinosaurs got big is a, is a tricky one. First of all, it's important to realize that not all dinosaurs got big. Uh, some dinosaurs were, in fact, very, very small. Uh, and also that different dinosaurs got big independently. It wasn't like it was a particular one phenomenon that they all got big at the same time. Different, the long-necked dinosaurs, the meat-eating dinosaurs, the, 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 the ornithopods, things like Saurolophus, Triceratops, they all got big kind of independently in their own reason. So at the end of the day, you need to come up with multiple different mechanisms to try to explain them. Now, sauropods are the weird one because if we look at every single dinosaur that we, that we know of, other than the long-necked dinosaurs, they all reach a very similar body size limit, which is actually seen in mammals as well. You reach the kind of 15-ton mark, and they, st they, they seem to stop. Sauropods are the only ones that break that mark. And so the question when, you, when, when people when we ask, why did dinosaurs get so big? Actually, it's why did sauropods get so big? The rest of them didn't actually get that big. They got to the same limit that we see in mammals. And so maybe that sort of short-term advantage to being big over time played out to a very similar limit. Sauropods, would you like me to answer the question of why sauropods go big? Yeah, you, you waiting for that? Yeah, we've, we've got, <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, if, if you, you've got about a minute yeah, yeah. to go. Yeah. <laughs> they reproduced like mice. It's the mice. They laid a lot of eggs. And they grew quickly, didn't they? They grew quickly. Oh, I Rapid read growth is probably consistent across multiple groups of dinosaurs. Like, but sauropods, somehow, they broke that limit of reproduction. Every other thing, you know, it, it, it's limited by the, your ability to create a viable population at large size. Sauropods broke that by making lots of offspring. And actually, they didn't care for their offspring. They just plopped those eggs and then so they did, off. So they did the turtle thing. They said, good luck. Thanks, kids. Yeah. We are out of time. Please oh, thank goodness. Nick, John, and Marissa. <laughs>
Thank you so much to the Welder's Dog Brewery. Thank you, people of Armadale. It's time to spread some paleo jam.